are living in a time when there's a lack of godly men in our nation. I've been reading recently a, an author, Michael uh, Hoff, who um, he, he writes novels, and one of the novels that uh, is one of his more well-known novels is Those Who Remain. And in that novel, there's a quote that has become pretty, I think, well-known these days. And I think it's become well-known because everybody that hears it relates to it because of the generation that we're living in. The quote is this, weak men create hard times, and hard times create strong men, and strong men create good times, and good times create weak men. You see the, the circular nature of how this works. And if, you, if you've been living under a rock, let me just tell you, we are living in a period of time where it is now weak men. We've had a, a nation that has had decades of what you would call relatively good times, built off of the backs of those strong men who laid the foundation for that. But we are certainly in an era of weak men. There's a lack of godly men in our churches today. Well, there's a lack of godly men anywhere. Much less, you know, there's, there's no godly men, it will appear, in the secular world that we live in. But there's very few godly men even in our churches today. And what we're going to be focusing on this morning, this is heavy and it needs to be said. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm passionate about it and I hope my prayer, men, is that uh, a smack, a spiritual smack of reality will hit you hard today. I am praying for an awakening. I'm praying for revival. I'd love to see something, a movement of some sorts in my lifetime because quite frankly, I am sick and tired of living in a world where I constantly see and hear of bad leaders, bad presidents, bad governors, bad mayors. We have bad pastors. We have bad men leading our institutions and businesses. Everywhere we look, it is the ungodly who are the ones leading. And we need the godly men of America, if there are any, we need the godly men of America to step up. And the place that it needs to start first is in the local church. I'm probably going to mention this a couple of times because I, I, you really need to hear this. The chapter that we're looking at, Paul is telling Timothy, he's given instructions on, on what qualifications the leaders of the church need to have. In chapter 1 and 2, he already given he gave instructions to the men in the church, he gave instructions to the women in the church, and now in this chapter he's given instructions to the leaders in the church. And these are the qualifications that make them worthy for the position, for the role. But I've said this many, many times over the years. When you look at these qualifications, every single solitary Christian man ought to be qualified to be a pastor, and at the very least be qualified to be a deacon. And yet, the reality is, you look around and very few men in the church are qualified in that capacity. And that's shameful. These are not unique giftings. These are not unique morals and qualities set aside for some spiritual elites that have arisen to the occasion to be able to lead people. This is basically Paul saying, hey, if anybody's going to lead your church, they need to be Christian." Act like Christians, think like Christians, walk and live their life like Christians, or else they're not qualified to be the leaders of other Christians. So we need godly men. And it's always been the case that the church has been void of men for 2,000 years, with the exception of little pockets here and there where there's awakenings and revivals where men have woken from their spiritual stumber, stump, stuber and have come to light of the gospel and have live their lives as leaders, godly leaders in their churches and in their communities. That, that's, a, that's a rare thing throughout the last 2,000 years. Generally speaking, it is the men who are absent in our churches. The, they call it the gender gap, and it's generally represented by this, at least right now in America, it's this. It's 61% of the average church attendance is of women and 39% of men. And what that means is on any given Sunday, Today, for instance, all across America, there are 
millions more women in church than there are men. And yet it's God who has called the men to lead out front as the spiritual leaders. Where are you at? What are you doing? Are, are, you, are you sending your wives and your kids to church while you stay home and watch football? Where are the men? Where are the godly leaders of this generation? And unfortunately, the numbers get worse. Recent survey from Barna Group says that church attendance has declined by 6% among men. It's all, it has historically always been low. And now that low is dipping 6% in recent years. Bible study attendance by men has declined by 8%. The percentage of men who volunteer at church during any typical week has slipped by 6%. The proportion of unchurched men at the same time has grown by 9%. You see the problem here? You've got less men participating in church, less men going to church, and more men becoming purely secular, not having anything to do with God or church or anything spiritual. A very, one striking statistic is this. 96% of all young men, and we say young men, that's the the bracket between 27 and 45. So I know some of you young men are like, that's not 40. My son says that 40s are old. <laughs> what do you know, son? Uh, 20, I'm a young man. It's 27 to 45. It, so 96% in that bracket reported that they are at least two years removed from their religious peak in life. In other words, when they look over their life, they would say, well, it, it's at least two years ago when I was a more religious person, a more spiritually minded person. Now, if you think those numbers are bad, that's 96%. Listen to this one. 70% among those 96% say that they are 10 years or more removed from their spiritual peak. In other words, the vast majority of the men in America when looking at their life between the ages of 27 and 45, look back over those years and say, well, it was at least 10 years ago when I was a, had my last spiritual experience. I was a spiritual person. Which would mean that the vast majority of men in America today are primarily secular. There's no religious or spiritual activity going on in their life whatsoever. And obviously, that has poured over into the local church as well. There is a void, there is a lack, there is a famine of godly men in our churches. And if there's no godly men, there's going to be no godly leaders. And if, if we look at our churches today and we think, well, why are our churches so bad? And why are the, the pastors, or I like to refer to them as clowns, why are the clowns that are leading our churches all across the how did they get to that point? Well, because there's no godly men in our churches. And something has to change. Something has to change. But once again, we are, we've lived through good times, and as a result, we have produced weak men. And I know I shouldn't even ask this question because we all know the answer to it, but how many of you are tired of bad leaders, bad pastors, bad you know, you name it, fathers, husbands. We look at the world that we live in today and we wonder what happened to all the good men? Where did they go? So, men, I really want to yell at you today and I feel justified in doing it. Take your Bibles if you're there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. I want to zero in on one phrase before we dive into the text. Paul says to Timothy, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, he desires a good work. I want to zero in on that first. Men, you were created and designed to work. God, from the very beginning of creation, Genesis chapter number two, God creates Adam. The very first thing that God does for Adam is he takes him to the garden and he says, I want you to oversee it. I want you to tend to it. I want you to, to 
You know, supervise it. Tend to it. Till it. Take care of it. From the very beginning, the very first thing that God does for Adam is he gives him work. And the work includes leadership. And that design that God began with men has not ceased to this day. Men, you were created by God, designed by God to work. And it's not just secular work. And you're not just working for yourself either, your selfish, ambitious goals. God has uniquely set you apart and designed you to be those that are working out what is good in society, leading out front with the good works. And I know as Protestants, we hate hearing that word, good work. No, we're not saved by good. We're saved by grace. It's by grace are you saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. But let me remind you, those that love Ephesians 2.8, that Ephesians 2.8 is followed up by The very next verse, verses 9 and 10, which says, We are saved not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yes, it is true, we are not saved by our good works, we are not justified by our good works, we are not redeemed by our good works, we are not made righteous in the eyes of God by our good works, and none of that divorces you from living a life of good works. You don't go to heaven because of your good works, but while you live on earth, God commands and calls you to live a life of good works. And apart from Christ, you're not even able to accomplish that. It is the Spirit of God and it is the power of Christ that gives you the power to rise to the occasion and to live the life of good works to which you are called. Men, listen to me. You are not simply called to pursue that that ambitious goals that you have set for yourself, whether it be in sports or that particular hobby or the career or whatever it is that you've sat in front of your eyes as an idol that has replaced the good works that God has given you. And I'm not saying those things are evil or wrong. But as a Christian and as a man, God has set you apart to lead the people of God, every one of you, to lead by the good works and the good life that you live. If you would join me in the book of Titus and go to Titus chapter number one. And I want to just read a few verses from these three chapters in Titus. Titus was a contemporary there with Timothy. First Timothy and the book of Titus written at the same time. And Paul is giving them both instructions about the needs that need to be taken care of in the church. And in Titus chapter number one, Paul begins to talk about what happens to men if they're left to themselves. And this is what was going on in the little island there of Crete, in the middle of the Mediterranean. So Titus is there to be a pastor and to plant churches in the area, but however, there's a problem in the the region there. The problem in this island of Crete is that they've got pathetic men, very few godly men. And he says in chapter 1, verse number 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, so a a prophet of the Cretan people, not not a biblical prophet, not a godly prophet, but one of their past prophets of several hundred years earlier, he said that, look at verse number 12, and I quote, Americans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy, I said American, I'm sorry, Cretans. Why would I say Americans? (laughs) How did that pop into my head? Cretans, Not, not that they have anything in common or anything like that, but Christians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Evil beast means that they, they follow their, their, their natural primitive longings. It's, it's whatever nature tells them to do. That's what, they're, that's what drives them. So he says they're liars, they're evil beasts, they're lazy gluttons. Lazy gluttons in the sense of not just eating, they indulge themselves. They, they gluttonized over everything and anything that pleases them. Now, notice what Paul says in verse number 12. This testimony is true. Paul's looking at the Christian and the, the people who live there, and he's like, yeah, yeah, your men are pathetic. You got lazy men. They're liars. They, they live for self. They, they follow all of their natural impulses. They, they are not the leaders in society. He says, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in their faith. And Paul says to to Titus, 
you are there to raise up godly men in a society that is void of godly men. So rebuke them, correct them, and set them on the straight and narrow. If you're there in chapter 1, look at verse number 5. And Paul says this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, lover of what is good. Let me focus in on that. Lover of what is good. The main characteristic of a godly man is that he loves godly things. He is a lover of godly works. Paul says to Titus here, if you're going to have leaders of God's people, they have to be godly. They have to love things that are godly. And you become the things that you love. Some of you men are great fishermen because you love fishing. Or you're great at golf because you love golf. You're probably really great at your your job, your career, because you love what you do. I wish that you loved God so much that you were also a godly leader in your home, and a godly leader at church, that you loved godly things, and that you gave yourself to that. So a leader of the church must be one who is a lover of what is good. Go to chapter 2, look at verse number 11. Chapter 2, he says in verse number 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. How many of you men in this room would define yourself as someone who is zealous for good works? You wake up in the morning and you just can't wait. What do you want me to do today, God? How can I glorify you in my home today? How can I serve my wife and love her the way you love the church? How can I love and minister and serve my children? How can I be the godly leader at the place that I go to work? How can I, my community and my neighborhood know that I love you and and I want to serve them and I want to love them? How can I be zealous for the good things of life, the good things of society, and the good things of God? How can I be someone that is zealous for this, passionate for this? How many of you men would say that you have God cravings? You don't even feel satisfied in the day until you've had time in his word. You don't even feel right or ready to go to work until you've had time in prayer because you're zealous for what is good. You're zealous for what is right. And you know that it will change your life and it'll change the lives of those around you. You know that it'll make the world that you live in better. And you're seeking God and you're pursuing him on your knees and in the word. Where are those men at? If you would look at chapter three and verse number one, Titus three, verse number one, he says, Remind them to be subject of the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. How many of you men are ready for every good work? What is it can I, that I can do in society that will make the community that I live in a better place? What kind of good work can I do in my home that will improve my marriage relationship with my wife? What kind of good work can I do with my children that will improve the relationship that I have with my children? How can I serve them? How can I raise them to know the Lord and pursue Christ? How can I do a good work in my neighborhood so that I can show them, not just with my words, but with my actions, that I love my neighbors because Jesus taught us to love our neighbors or ourself? How can I do these good things? Look at verse number 8. He says, Titus 3, verse number 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Paul tells Titus, I want you to remind your church regularly, constantly, affirming again and again that the men in the church need to maintain good works in their life. 
Not getting better and better at their golf swing, getting better and better at spending time with God, getting better and better at pursuing the things of God, serving those around them to maintain that good work. You know, think about the, the phrasing there, maintain good works. Good works is not natural, men. Your natural disposition is to please yourself. Do the things that will entertain you. Pursue the things in life that make you happy. If you're going to live a life of good works towards God and towards others, that's something that has to be maintained in your life. You have to think about it. You have to plan for it. You have to prep for it. You have to sacrifice. I'm not going to do the thing that I want to do today because it's, that's not what's good for society. That's not what is good for my home. That is not what's good for my own life. I'm putting God first. I'm putting my home first. I'm putting my kids before me. I'm putting my wife before myself. I'm putting God before everything else. And I'm going to serve the world around me, maintaining that good life of good works. Do you live that way, men? Look at verse number 14. He says, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. One of the ways of maintaining that good works is being keenly aware of the needs that are represented all around you. Men, m most of us, and I'm the same way, most of us will walk through our life not even aware of the urgent needs represented by the people that surround us day in and day out. Nothing breaks my heart more than to know that there are real, genuine needs represented by the widows in our church, and there are no men to step up to the occasion to serve. Nothing is more heartbreaking to know that the church has needs volunteer positions that need to be filled, and there are no men who have any sense of urgency or desire to fulfill the roles. There's nothing more sad than to know that your community that you live in is falling apart. You're watching the schools fall apart. You're watching the society secularly all around you fall apart, and there are no godly men who want to step up for the, to the occasion and do the right thing to serve in a way that will make a difference in the world that they live in. There's no desire to maintain good works and meet the urgent needs. Go back to chapter number one of Titus. You see, here's the problem. Here's the problem with the men in our churches. The church there in Crete had bad teachers, bad men in the church, and those immoral men were the ones who wanted to lead. Those immoral men were the ones who wanted to be the teachers. Those immoral men were the ones who wanted to have prominence. And Paul tells Titus in chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. When you live in a nation that on the backside of good times has created weak men, you have men who aren't even qualified to do good works. They have disqualified themselves from even serving God because with their lips they profess God. They profess to know God. They profess to love God. They profess to serve God. They profess to follow God in all of their ways, but yet in their actions they actually deny him. It speaks an entirely different message. And Men, you can tell your family all you want that you believe in God and that you serve God and that you're all for God, but your family knows your actions. And your actions speak way louder than your words do. And there are men in the church who, with their lips, they, they talk a lot of good things, a lot of great things about God and how they're going to serve God and they're going to do great things for God. And yet their lives are in shambles. They're wrecked. And God says in his eyes they're abominable, disobedient, and they have disqualified themselves from serving God. This ought not be. And you say, well, what does a godly man look like? What does a godly leader look like? And for that, let's, as fast as we can, look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3 in the first seven verses. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse, verse number 1, beginning verse number 1, he gives 18 qualifications to be a leader in the church. The first qualification is this. He says in verse number 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man, pause, that's the first qualification. 
It has to be a man. He didn't say if someone identifies as he, him. It, it, this is, a, as was pointed out in the previous chapter, a biological man, because God has, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of the garden, he has set aside men to be the leaders in society and in the church. This is a, a universal truth all throughout the scriptures. And if you want more information on that, go back and listen to the previous sermon, sermon on chapter number two. But he says here, if a man, that's the first qualification, desires, that's the second qualification. Now, there are and has been for years many, many men sitting in the church who have thought to themselves, I would, I would serve God in some capacity. I would do, you know, I'd lead. I'd do something. If, if God wanted me to serve in some way, I'll serve him. And they'll sit back and they'll, they'll say to themselves, I, I, maybe God will call me into ministry one day. Maybe God will call me to be a pastor sometime. And they sit back and they wait for some warm, fuzzy feeling. They sit back and wait that, for some lightning bolt to hit them and, and a moment of inspiration and, a, and an audible voice from heaven to say, now go and be a pastor for me or go and be a missionary for me. And you're, you're waiting for that moment. But that's, that's not what the text says. And nor does it say it anywhere else in the New Testament. The role of being a leader in a church, an elder, a pastor, a bishop, the, all these titles that are used, that is given to those who long to have it, who wish to do it, who have a desire for that. God has called all of you men to be leaders in your homes, but not all are qualified to be leaders in the church. And it has to be a desire. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, Peter gives instructions along the same lines here. He says that it, it can't be by compulsion. It has to be willingly. Compulsion in the sense of, I can't just look out in the crowd and say, yeah, you, David Amos, you're the next pastor. Get up here. I can't, <laughs> I, I can't just m make it a mandate. I like you. Your, your, your turn to get up here and, and lead for a while. I can't do that. It has to be something of the heart. It has to be willingly. It has to be something between you and God saying, Lord, I'd like to serve you in this way. And that's a wonderful thing. Having a desire to serve God, having a desire to lead God's people is one of the most noble and grand and wonderful things that a person could possibly do. But you have to be qualified. You can't just say, well, I feel it in my heart. I've heard that way too many times over the years. Too many men have come to me over the years and said, I want to be a pastor, I want to lead, I want to serve in this capacity, or I want to preach to the congregation. And I look at their life and say, and they usually will tell me, God has called me, God has told me, God has put this on my heart. And I'll look at them and say, I, I don't care what's on your heart. The heart is deceitfully wicked, far beyond what any man could know or think. That's what the prophet in the Old Testament told us. I don't care what is or what you think is on your heart. What I care about is, do you meet the qualifications that God has given us? You can desire the position of being a leader all you want, but are you qualified to be the leader? And unfortunately, what generally happens in most churches is the least qualified man in the room is the one who wants to be the leader, the one whose lives is in shambles, the ones who have addictions, the ones that have all kinds of problems and don't meet any of the qualifications, and yet they are the ones who want to be the leaders and the preachers. And I've seen this year after year after year after year of my life. We need godly men. You say, I, I want to be, I want to lead God's people. I want to be a pastor. I want to be a missionary. Then the number one thing, sir, that you need to work on in your life is every day giving your life to God. Every day. If you want to serve God's people, begin by serving God. Love him. Be faithful to him. Stay true to him. Consistent to him. Week in and week out. And when you become qualified then God will open up doors and opportunities for you to serve. So he says, verse number one there, if a man desires the position of a bishop. Now there's two titles given in the New Testament that are often confusing, bishop and presbyter. That's where the Presbyterians get their, their title, presbyter, presbyterian. Those are not actual English words. They're transliterations of Greek words. A bishop 
translated into English is the English word overseer. Or you could say in the modern vernacular supervisor. It's the one who oversees what is going on in the affairs of the church. That's what a bishop is. The word is episcopate. And then you have the presbyter, which that's a, that's a Greek word. Presbyter just simply means elder. And so in the New Testament, you have these interchangeable titles all for the same position. Bishop, elder, pastor, presbyter, overseer, teacher, steward, shepherd. These are all talking about the same position, the same role. And we know that because in many of the verses in the New Testament, they're, they're used interchangeably even within the same verse. We saw that just a moment ago in Titus chapter number 1. They're, they're, they're the same position. It's just different titles drawing out different aspects of what it is that they do or how they lead. But this is basically just a, a leadership role. So if you desire to be a leader in the church, he says you desire a good work. But qualification number three is in verse number two where he says a bishop then must be blameless. Now he didn't say, fellow, that, that you have to be sinless. That's not what he said. He says you have to be blameless. The Greek word is an imagery word. It means that nothing can grab a hold of you. Nothing can cling on. And the idea is that if you come along and you say, I want to be a leader in the church. I want to be a preacher. I want to be a pastor. I want to be an elder. Well, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. There's no other noble calling in all of your life. But if someone in the church can come along and say, yeah, no way. I, yeah, let me tell you something. He does this, this, and this, and I've seen him do this, and he, he beat his wife up, and his kids, you know, he's like, and on the list goes, like, yeah, no, no, no. He can say what he wants, but I, I've, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of problems. You have to be blameless within the congregation. Blameless, the, the word just simply means that no fault can be, no one in the congregation can give fault. It's not like the guy can stand up and say, okay, I'd like to be a pastor, and if everyone else is like, yeah, I can't think of a better candidate. I, I, can't, I can't think of any reason why not. Can you think, can you, do you see any reason why he shouldn't serve? And Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I think you should pursue that. No, nobody has any issues. Nobody has any is problems with you pursuing that. So that's what he says here. Must be blameless within the congregation. Number four, verse number two, the husband of one wife. Now, we have, if you've been in Christianity for any amount of time, you know that there are three vices that, that have a problem with pastors more than anything else. And that is money, power, and sex. We've all heard stories of pastors that have fallen prey to the sins and the temptations of money, power, and sex. And this one is dealing with sex. The, the phrase there, the husband of one wife, doesn't mean that he's never been divorced. It doesn't mean that, that he has to be married either. Timothy wasn't married. Titus, uh, that we know of, wasn't married. It's not talking about Paul wasn't married. It's not talking about marriage. What it's talking about, the Greek word there, is a one-woman man. It's speaking of his sexual purity. Is he a sexually pure man? Is he, is he a polygamist? Is he, does he cheat on his wife? Does he, does he go to the brothel? You know, a lot of people might argue like, well, you know, I'm, I'm qualified to be a pastor because I've never been divorced and I've been faithful to my wife for all these years. Now, if you view pornography every single night, then you've disqualified yourself. You're not faithful. You're, you're sexually impure. And honestly, men, we need sexual purity, not just in the leadership of the church. We need sexual purity in our churches. We need godly men in our congregations that are sexually pure, not just faithful to their wives, not just true and faithful in their homes, but in their minds and their hearts as well. Now, they're not dabbling in adultery in their mind or in their eyes as Jesus talked about. And nothing destroys a man's mind and his heart. Nothing destroys a man's home more than pornography, which is pervasive on a level today that history, I don't believe, has, has ever seen. And every man struggles with this. There's no escaping it. You're bombarded by it in every corner of society that we live in today. And my, my cry to you men this morning, abandon pornography now. Rebuke it. Embrace Christ. Embrace freedom. 
Run from the addiction of this. For your own health, statistically, it's destroying you. Let me give you, I, I, the list is unending when it comes to the damages that consistent pornography does to a man's life. Let me give you four real quickly. It weakens your brain. It weakens your brain. Porn creates me mental disorders like stress, poor focus, depression, social anxiety, all of these because of obsessiveness over pornography. It kills your inner drive, men. Men who are hooked on watching porn struggle with their financial status, their relationships, their career. Their lives become pathetic. It messes with your test testosterone levels. It gives you, your, your T level is what gives you your, your willpower and your desire and your drive, men. If you're hooked on pornography, you're destroying that. It's going to lead to brain frog and having a fog and having a weak body and unsure of what you should do with your life. It leads to pathetic and worthless men who have no drive, no ambition to do anything for the cause of God or even what's good for society. It lowers your self-esteem. Addiction to porn will drive you into a pit of despair, regrets, self-loathing, feeling guilt all the time. And men, it'll take you months, if not years, to recover from these things. Now, this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about how pornography, or the Greek word porneo, which covers all sexual immorality, he says that that type of sin, those who dabble in porneo, all sexual sin, it doesn't just damage those that are around them. It is one of the only sins that damages you from the inside out. It corrodes and corrupts you like a spiritual cancer. And Paul is telling Timothy, you do not get the men who are sexually addicted in your church and let them to be leaders in the church. There has to be sexual purity. Nothing will destroy a home faster than sexual immorality. Nothing will destroy a nation faster than sexual immorality. Anyone who has ever picked up a history book knows that every great civilization of the past found its demise and its fall in their own sexual sins. And we are right on the precipice of watching our own civilization collapse because of the sexual sins in our generation. We need men who will be sexually pure before God and before their churches. And so he says a husband of one wife or a one woman man, a sexually pure man, Verse number two there, he also says temperate, which is speaking about physical actions, meaning he's orderly, he's not erratic, he's not extreme. Extremism will disqualify a man from serving as a leader in the church. If he can't hold a job down because he's switching, he gets bored and decides to do something different, or he wants to move here or move there, or he's switching ideas and hobbies and beliefs and convictions and just everything in his mind, there's nothing settled, there's, nothing, there's no firm convictions, he's just wishy-washy all the time. Unfortunately, those are the type of men who often come to me saying they want to be a pastor. And you know why? Because, well, they, you know, they had a dream that week and now their whole plan about life has changed. They're like, I think I should be a pastor. You know, I was going to become a businessman last week, but this week I think I should be a pastor. That's a wishy-washy person. They're not temperate in their life. He also goes on to say they need to be sober-minded. That's the mental actions. It's not just their physical life, it's their mental life. There needs to be self-control in the mind, moderate. They need to not be obsessive-compulsive on their opinions. I've seen this too many times with pastors that they become a pastor, and then all of their sermons are about their hobby horses. Like every, they may choose different passages of scripture, but they're virtually talking about the same stuff every week, the things that they're interested in, the things that they're passionate about. And that is not what a pastor is supposed to do. He's supposed to simply open up God's word and, and share what God has said, not what they say, not what they feel, not what they think. This is not share my opinions hour. This is open God's word, read it, and explain what it means and how it applies to your life. He also says that they need to be of a good behavior, and that's speaking of their verbal actions, meaning that they're not, they're not the type of guy that will stand on stage and say a lot of good moral things, and then in the lobby share dirty jokes, or at home have, you know, language at home that is just not appropriate, that's immoral. 
or at the job site sharing and talking about things that disqualify them from being leaders in the church. He also says that they need to be hospitable. I love the Greek word there. It says, the Greek word simply means lover of strangers. A man who's going to lead the church must love every person in the church, whether he knows them well or not. A man who leads the church must also love the community he lives in. In other words, if you're going to lead the church, you can't, you can't be the, the person who has favorites, tribalism, or your groupies, the people that you go talk to and you won't talk to anybody else. Literally, if you're going to lead the church, you have to love every single soul in the church without partiality. You've got to love every single person in the community. You have to have a love of getting to know people, embracing strangers, serving those that you don't know, befriending people you've never met before. And let me remind you, this is what a godly man looks like. I know this is qualifications for a pastor, but I, I have to say this again. This is what every single man who calls himself a Christian in this room, this is, what, this is how you should be living. You should live this way, feel this way. He says they're also able to teach, the end of verse number two. And of all the qualifications, this is the one that makes it most unique from, let's say, the qualifications of a deacon or even that of just a, a godly man, because this is a qualification that, that is in that category of you would call gifting as well, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. These are, this is a gift, the gift of teaching or the gift of exhortation. And not all elders are gifted in this, Paul will say in 1 Timothy 5, verse 22. Not all elders are preachers. Not all elders are teachers. But all must be able to. And the able is the important part here. Every man who wants to lead other Christians, he must know what Christians believe. He must be able to defend the scriptures. He must be able to articulate doctrine. He must be able to defend theology. He must be able to win lies about scripture or lies about Christ or a manipulation about the gospels being presented in the church. He must be able to stand up and contend for the faith, to be able to teach what is right versus what is wrong. Every leader, every elder, every pastor in the church must be able to do that. Number 10, look at verse 3. He says, not given to wine. And the Greek word there simply means staying. It's someone who wants to stay near wine. It's not just a prohibition against drinking wine or drinking alcoholic beverages. It is more of a prohibition about the desire for it, the hunger for it. I, I want to hang out at the bar. I, I want to I go to where the party's at, where the whiskey flows freely. It's not having the desire for that. And my firm conviction is that pastors should not be drinking alcoholic beverages in general. And I don't believe that drinking alcohol is a sin. I don't see that. It, nothing that you can drink or eat is sinful. It's material. They are inanimate objects. But it's what you do with it. The Bible's very clear on this. It, it, like, people really go a little too deep on this. It's not rocket science. The Bible's absolutely clear on this. If you drink too much, that's called drunkenness, and that's prohibited, and you shouldn't do it. If you eat too much, that's called gluttony, and that's prohibited, and you shouldn't do it. If you eat too much, you're going to do harm to your body and possibly others. And if you drink too much, you're going to be doing harm to your body and possibly others, and it's prohibited. But drinking is not, just as eating is not prohibited. Nothing wrong with eating a Twinkie here and there. But don't eat the whole box in one setting. That's gluttony. Can I? I I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> I struggle. Look, I eat. Let's look at it. You guys have no idea how much I eat. Now, I'm a hyperactive person. I run a lot. I exercise a lot. But one of my sins is gluttony. You would not know that by looking. But one of my sins is gluttony. I will sit and pig out like like. And then I'll, you know, confess it later. Lord, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I struggle with food. I love food. I love bad food, really bad food. If it, the badder, the worse it is, the more I love it. But that's sin, and you should not gluttonize. Drunkenness is the same thing. And in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, it was told to the priests that they cannot drink alcoholic beverages. 
In the book of Proverbs, it says that alcoholic beverages are not for kings. It was prohibited for the kings of Israel to drink alcoholic beverages. And why is that? Well, you don't want, if you're a leader of the people and you're a moral leader of the people, you don't want to do things that might prohibit you from being able to lead in a biblical, God-honoring way. Let me ask you this. Can drinking cause my morals to be impaired? Yes. Can drinking cause a weaker brother to stumble? Yes. Can drinking as a pastor become a means of escape? And I've seen this with a lot of pastors over the years because pastoring is a very stressful job. And even pastors that are friends of mine have disqualified themselves from ministry because of the stress of ministry drove them to the bottle to the point to where they became alcoholics and no longer able to be pastors. If you, if you live the stressful life that I live, you're tempted to go to the bottle to just ease some of the stress. But that's not where you're supposed to ease the stress, on your knees and in the Word and in your relationship with Christ and others. Does a pastor lose anything by not drinking? I don't think so. Do I gain anything? I think I've gained a lot over the years by just simply choosing to abstain from something that I don't believe is a sin. And I don't believe there's a restriction from it. Jesus drunk alcoholic beverages. The disciples drunk alcoholic beverages. Timothy drunk alcoholic beverages here. We know that because just a couple of chapters later, Paul will tell him, stop not drinking alcoholic beverages and drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. You're being a little too extreme on that particular point, Timmy. Timothy, like I said, Paul can call him Timmy. He's like a, his son in the faith. I don't think there's any biblical restrictions on drinking, but I think if you're going to be a leader of people, a godly leader, you don't want to put anything out there that might in the future be a stumbling block. You don't want to put anything out there that might cause you to disqualify yourself from leading others in a godly way, and so I have personally chosen to be a teetotaler. And I will say this, in all of the years that I have been a pastor, no one has ever walked into my office and talked about how much wonderful and great and grand their life is because they drink. But I have heard countless stories of people whose lives are wrecked and they feel lots of regret and sorrow over becoming addicted to alcohol. And when we speak of addiction here, he says, not given to wine. This really applies to any addiction. And it doesn't have to be wine. It could be drugs. It could be entertainment. It could be anything. A pastor, a leader of the church, should not be someone who is addicted. But look at verse number three once again. Number 11, not violent. And this should go without saying. A pastor should be the person who brings peace in any in situation. If there's violence that's happening in the church, I know you know, back in the, the 300s, you had St. Nicholas who punched a man at the Council of Nicaea because of their differences on theological matters. So Santa Claus punched somebody. He was a pastor, so he, he wasn't, he, he got upset. And so this is a historic fact. It's a, but that, and a lot, of, lot of people look over history like, yeah, hey, yeah, Santa Claus, he punches people. He's for the right reason. St. Nicholas, he was a bad dude. And as much as that's laughable, it's actually not permissible. We're, we're, we're not supposed to be violent. We're, we're the ones that bring peace to any situation. If the temperatures are getting hot and, and it seems like a fight is... I've, I've seen fights at churches before. I've heard stories of brawls happening during church business meetings. And the pastor should be the one who is calming things down, bringing civility, bringing peace, bringing order into... I mean, we're all people, and our emotions can get fired up from time to time. And you need a godly man who can control his emotions, who can control his passions, so that when all the room begins to get out of control, at least there's somebody there that can bring peace to the situation. So not violent. Not greedy for money, he also says. I don't think I need to belabor that. You don't get into ministry to get rich. And those pastors that are trying to buy their fourth jet or get their third multi-million dollar vacation home, they are immoral, sinful, abominable in the eyes of God. That is wickedness at the highest level. That is, that is men who are preying on the people of their congregation 
particularly those that are poor, because these are typically always your health, wealth, and prosperity gospel preachers. So, those, so the, the poor of society are coming in, hearing the message, hoping that they can get lifted out of that poverty. And the, the wicked, evil man that's leading that congregation says to the poor people in the congregation, if you give me all of your money, then God will bless you, and you'll be able to live life the way I do. And I can't think of anything that is more pathetic, awful. And these men, there is a, there is a hot place in hell for them. I do not believe that they are Christian. I believe that they, are the very, they represent the very opposite of that. And he says here, not lovers of money, not greedful for money. But number 13, they must be gentle. The opposite of violent. Gentle is you're, you're not abrasive with people. You're merciful. You're gracious with people. He says not quarrelsome, meaning that you're not... The other, the violent, that's physical. This is more verbal. You're not the type of person that easily gets into an argument, easily gets into a verbal fight with people. Whether it's on texting or online on Facebook or Twitter or in person, pastors are not supposed to be getting in fights. It's not our job as godly men to be fighting with people. Our job is to be loving people, being gracious with people. Be merciful with people. Number 15, at the end of verse number three, not covetous. We don't greed, we don't have a greed for the things of life, not just money, but the stuff in life. Verse number four, he says, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house well, how will he take care of the house of God? This is the only one of the qualifications that Paul gives any commentary on. That a pastor needs to rule his house well, means he needs to oversee the affairs of his house in a godly way, that his house needs to reflect his leadership abilities. If he can't lead well at home, how is he going to lead well at the house of God? Which I know Michael said you're not supposed to say that, but I said it anyway, the house of God, which we, we, this is the house of God, and together, collectively, corporately, we're in the house of God. So if he can't lead his home well, how will he lead the church well. Look at verse number 16. And this is number 17 of the qualifications, not a novice. It's a cool word picture of the Greek word there. It simply means newly planted tree. In other words, he's not green. He's not new. He's, he's not a, be, a beginner Christian. He may be passionate and he may have, speak well and hold himself well and look well, but that doesn't mean that enough time has been given to verify whether he is qualified to serve as the leader of God's people. And so he says, not a novice. In chapter 5, verse number 22, he says, don't lay hands on anyone hastily. Don't, don't elect someone to be an elder really fast. In fact, the model rule is this. Hire elders slowly and fire them swiftly. And generally speaking, most churches do opposite. They see a man, they like what they hear, they like what they see, and as quick as they can, they try to get him into a position of leadership, only to find out a few months later they made a mistake and that the man has all kinds of moral failures and they don't really know what to do about it. And now they've committed themselves to him, and he's in the church, and he's not quite committing you know, crimes to call the police over, but he's not a good guy either, and so here he is, and they just let it drag on, and it, and it destroys and corrodes and corrupts the church over time because they refuse to fire him. When it comes to the leader of the church, slowly, prayerfully, meticulously go over the qualifications, get to know the individual, talk to people in the community about the individual, talk to people in the church about the individual, and when the time is right and God gives peace to the congregation, you elect that person as an elder. And the moment that there are issues, you fire. You don't wait. That is inappropriate, and it has done too much harm and damage to churches all across America. So he says, not a novice. Verse number seven, if you will, last one here. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. It's an interesting thing that he's saying here. He's implying, and I agree with him, I believe it, he's implying that Satan sets up traps that the church 
is prey to often. Think of a mouse trap, and he puts a little bait out there. And the, the bait is the bait, the bait is a guy who sounds good and looks good, and he's a great speaker, and he's, a, he, he's got a great personality, and, and Satan puts him out there as a bait for the church to take a hold of. And they'll think, okay, I think he's qualified. I think he's a good person for this. He's a good speaker, holds himself well. And they put him in position, and all along, Satan was simply using that to bring a reproach on the church because people outside the church, they knew him. They knew he was a snake. They knew he was corrupt. They, they've worked with him. They know him. They know his character. They know his personality. They know his style. But Satan weasels his way, works his way, these leaders, into the church. He says, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. So, yes, there needs to be a good reputation with, with those within the congregation. But a man who's going to lead God's people must have a good reputation in the community as well. Because you put a man who has a bad reputation in the community, and you make him a leader of the church, the community is going to look at us and go, what is wrong with you people? Do you not have any morals? you don't have any convictions? You don't care who leads you? You don't care how bad of a dude he is? You're just going to put anybody in front of you? And Satan will use that to make a mockery of the gospel, to make a mockery of the church. And we see this happen all the time. Well, I'm going to zero back to this subject of good works, and I'll read this and I'm going to close. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I'm going to focus on that good works again. When the world tries to criticize you as a Christian, and you more specifically as a godly man, I pray that the world will see your good works, that you'll have a good reputation, that you'll have a good record of faithfully loving God, faithfully serving God, and that when the accusations come hurling along, and when they try to say that you're not a good godly man, that it won't stick because of your lifelong good works and God will be glorified. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I went a long time this morning and I wanted to, not wanted to, but I felt the need to because as I told you this morning, I have mixed emotions. I'm heartbroken. I'm a little angry. I'm not angry at you. I'm angry at what the world has become. I'm angry that on a, on a Sunday that I'm under the weather and I stay home, and I just go from website to website and watch live services, and half the ones that I watch, I just feel like are a joke. And it, I, I feel... I'm like, this isn't church, and that's not preaching. And what are you guys thinking? And why are you doing that at church? Where did you read that in the Bible? So I get a little, you know, I'm just going from website to website, getting angry at what I'm seeing going on in the world around me and thinking, what happened to us? How did we get here? Where are the godly leaders? Where are the men who are going to contend for the faith? Where are the men who are going to stand for what is right? And then I realize, when I look out at you, the congregation, and particularly you men, you are the problem and the solution. You're the problem because we're all guilty, we're all part of the reason we're here, myself included. But at the same time, we are also the solution. We are the men in this room who know the truth. We know the scriptures. We know what God has said. And we can make a decision. We can make a choice right here, right now, before we leave here today. That I will be a godly man. I will pursue godly works. I will lead my family. I will be a leader in my church. I will be what God has called me. And I'll stop being the problem. And I'll start being the solution. You see, too many of you men out there, you think that the world that we live in right now has gone to pot and it's all messed up and everything's bad because somebody somewhere didn't vote the way you think they should. That's silliness. Grow up. 
We are all the problem. And we can all be the solution. We have all strayed away from righteousness. We have all strayed away from where God would want us to be. And if this nation, if this community, and this church is ever going to see times of revival, times of awakening, times of spiritual vitality, then all of us need to spend time pursuing God, seeking God, and giving ourselves continually to God. I pray that we will.